Hey everybody, Pastor Darren here, and uh, today we're going to be talking about trust. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. All right, just a couple days ago I saw that there are uh, predictions about divorce rates to be going through the roof in this season. Overall crime is down right now, but domestic violence is up. In fact, we see last month um, that China was re- was reporting an all-time highs in their divorce rates. And the the worry is that that same pattern is going to take place in the U.S. and that within the next couple months, we will see divorce rates um, spike here in the U.S. And so people would say, well, of course, because for the very first time um, ever, all marriages, (laughs) people are having to actually truly live together all day. Like here in Washington State, you can't even leave your home unless it's for something essential like groceries, like, um, like coffee, like um, jogging, um, fresh, I, I don't know. There, there's a bunch of crazy, like, anyways, it's, it's confusing. But technically, we're, we're not supposed to leave our homes, you know, period. Which means that, Like technically, we're supposed to be together all the time, nonstop, okay? And that is triggering all kinds of, all kinds of issues. But these aren't new issues. It's that there are issues that, that exist within our own hearts. Things that we've never been forced to have to deal with. And the problem is, is that iron sharpens iron, right? But if iron never has to be around each other, then we can be married and we can be friends or we can, you can be my my parents, you can be my children, whatever. But if we're never having to be around each other for very long, we never get to sharpen each other. So there's a lot of sharpening that's taking place right now. And actually what we're talking about is um, a breakdown in relationship, a breakdown in intimacy, and a testing to see how strong we are individually and how strong our relationships are. Everything is very extreme right now. And so uh, whatever your natural bents are to, to lean a certain way, right now that lean is more extreme than it's ever been. We see people making very extreme choices and decisions. They are, people are saying very extreme things that this, because of what's taking place right now, we find a a fire, (laughs) a tenacity in us. And at times that's needed and at times that's great. At at other times it can be kind of um, destructive. So today we're talking about trust. We're also talking about distrust. We're talking about that place of really truly trusting in God and really truly trusting in each other. If we can trust the Lord and if we can trust in each other, okay, then we will find that when this is all said and done, The war will be over and we will have won. Why? Because we prioritize the things in our life that really mattered. We prioritize the people in our life that really mattered. And we will find that if we can invest into our relationships, we will win. But if we invest in our own pride and selfishness, then we will lose. Let's go to the word. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. Trust. Everybody just say trust. Say it out loud right now. Trust. Very good. Trust where? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean, okay, on your own thinking. In all your ways. In what ways? In all your ways. Acknowledge him. And he will make straight your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment 
to your bones. All right, we're going to begin here. We're going to begin with trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. This is a brilliant, amazing, unprecedented opportunity to learn how to trust in the Lord with all all of our heart. This is not talking about our blood pumping muscle, okay? About our physical heart. This is talking about the seat of our emotions, okay? This is the seat of where all of our happiness and anger and rage and sadness is conceived in our heart. So this place where you frame out your will, I will, I will not, okay? This place of your emotions, ha, 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 okay? Um, this is your heart. It is this place where you think, where you process, where you investigate all of your options, okay? Take all of those components. That is your heart, okay? Trust in God with all of your heart, with that place, with that place of your uh, where where of of your um, of your awareness of your discernment, lean it all in and trust in the Lord, and that trust will be indicative of your relationship with Him, because we do not trust people that we do not have relationship with. That's the bottom line. That that we can believe in a God, but. We don't necessarily have to trust him. Sometimes people will worship God, but they don't really trust him. Sometimes people will know all the facts and statistics about God, but they don't really trust him. Why? Because they don't really know him. If we want to trust God in this time, listen, I would love to just say, here we go, this is all you have to do, trust him. Do you trust him? If not, you better trust him. What does that mean? What does any of this mean? It means we have got to get to know him. Who is this God? Who is this Jesus? Who is this Holy Spirit? Who is this Father? Who is this three in one? Who is this radical community of divinity that at great cost to himself laid his life down on a cross so that we could be knit in, that we could be included so that we could be a part of this incredible royal family? Who is this God? In times like these, we need to be challenged. That we've, we need to create space. We need to create time. We need to create these moments where nothing else matters except for him. And when we get to know him, then we will begin to trust him. The same thing is true of people in our lives that you aren't ever really going to truly trust your spouse until you get to know your spouse. You say, well, I don't trust my spouse because my spouse is untrustworthy. Well, that's not necessarily the case. That's a judgment. You see, the, the minute we say somebody's untrustworthy, now we have established a judgment and that now gives, now we are enabled to walk in distrust against that person for the rest of our life. Why? Because they failed us. And the same thing is true of that when people of influence and people that we look up to, when they fail us, sometimes that distrust, it actually poisons our own soul so that we make judgments against other people. So now I can never trust somebody in authority again. I will never trust another president again. I will never trust another pastor again. I will never trust another parent again. That when it comes to trust and it comes to relationship, when it comes to intimacy, all of these factors are radically interwoven together. And when we try to compartmentalize our thinking and our processing and we give ourselves permission to withhold a part of our heart from God, we will find that we will withhold a part of our heart from people that we love. So if sparks are flying right now, praise the Lord. If things are getting real ugly right now, praise the Lord. Why? Because in these areas, we have incredible opportunities to really get to know who we are, to really get to know who other people are, and to see that within the, within the emotion, 
is a passageway into some information that we've never had before, into some raw data that we've never had before, into this place of understanding. Because at the end of the day, we don't just want to merely love people with just in words only, I love you, I love you, I love you, but I don't truly know you. I don't truly understand you. I don't understand what makes you angry. I don't understand what makes you cry. I don't understand what motivates you. I don't understand what turns you on. I haven't taken the time. We haven't invested the time. And now for the very first time, we actually have time to begin to forge a place of intimacy so that we aren't just saying, I trust you, but I don't really know you. We can begin to develop this place of deep knowing so that there can be a place of deep trusting. So that's the very first thing, that we learn to trust God with all of our heart, with the deepest parts of ourself. And that means that we get to know the deepest parts of him and his heart. The next thing I'd like for us to look at is this place where we would, in this season, make a covenant to not worship ourselves. You say not worship ourselves. Yep, because there's a lot of temptation right now to elevate ourselves to a place of divinity. This place of, we say worship ourselves. Well, it says here, do not lean on your own understanding. Okay, and then skip a beat. Later in the text, it says, be not wise in your own eyes. Eyes. And so the secret here to intimacy and trust in the Father and into this place of fruitfulness, into this dynamic where there's healing for your flesh and refreshing to your bones is that we've got to take ourselves off the throne of our own lives and we've got to put Jesus back in that throne. Lean not on your own understanding. Don't worship yourself. Paul would say in Galatians, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Why? Because when you do, that pride will rob you of relationship with others. Paul talked about within that passage that, hey, um, you're going to need to to have a, a humble heart in, in your posture towards others when they fail you. Why? Because one day you will fail other people and you will want to have mercy in your own failure. Don't worship yourself. Worship God. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Don't be wise in your own eyes. But I know the answer. Maybe and maybe not. That in this time, it's not about uh, uh, elevating ourselves and posturing ourselves and, and in such a way where we can lord over others. But there is opportunity here to truly get to know God, to truly get to know people. And in this place of communion and in this place of community, there is mutual understanding, mutual submission, and we don't have to try to control each other. We can learn to trust each other. And in this place of communication, there can be collaboration and we can get breakthroughs that we've been praying for for the last 10 years. Yeah? So let's trust God with all of our hearts. And two, let's stop worshiping ourselves. Okay? Let's stop worshiping our pain. Let's stop worshiping our offense. Let's stop worshiping our own demands. And let's reset. And number three, let's fear God. And this ties in with number two so much. You say fear God. Yep, let's check it out. It says, you know, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Yeah. You say, what does fearing God look like? It just said. You know, when we say fear God, we don't mean like be terrified of God. Like, ah, I'm so afraid of God. I don't even want to talk to him. I don't even want to pray. I don't want to worship him. Why? He might kill me. No, that's the wrong kind of fear. And sometimes people walk in that kind of thing. You know, it always makes me a little nervous when, you, when you've got people screaming and finger pointing saying, you don't fear God. Like, like, I'm like, dude, you don't even know what you're talking about. What does it look like to fear God? Well, just it, it just said. It says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. What is fearing the Lord? It means turning away from evil, turning away from stupidity, turning away from selfishness and turning into him. It's turning away from your own opinion and turning into his opinion. It means that you, you do right by God first. You do right by people second and you do right by yourself third. 
It is this place where, um, where there's a rhythm, there's a metronome, there is a predictability about the people of God. Why? Because there is a, a moral, uh, 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 there's a moral baseline that establishes what is allowed and what is not allowed. You know, you know for, for example, like I am a believer in God, I am a worshiper of God, and I fear the Lord and I love the Lord, but I also love Andrea. I love my wife. I love my spouse. But there is a spiritual, moral baseline and compass that governs my heart and it governs the options. And so if, I, if Andrea and I get into a little argument, um, I am not allowed to go places in my heart uh, that are outside of Andrea. Why? Because I have a covenant. I have become one one flesh with her. Therefore, for Andrew and I, separation is not an option. Why? Because we have been joined together. It is this place where my decisions have to be submitted to the will of God. Why? Because of the fear of God. Because I have leaned away from the old Darren. I've leaned into the ways of God. And that means that the ways of God have to govern my ways. There are options sometimes that believers think uh, uh, might work for them, but they shouldn't work for them. There are places that believers will go in their minds and their hearts and their understandings. There are things that people will do. Why? Because they, they, haven't, they haven't leaned away from the old and leaned into the, two, into the new. They, they've, 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 they've taken the old with them. They've tried to bring the old with them into the old thoughts, old words, old behaviors, um, uh, nasty nasty things and, and then and then and then how do you know that you have nasty things in you because it comes out of you if there's nasty things in you it will come out of you it will come out of your behaviors it'll come out of your actions and and so this place of fearing God that we don't get to just do whatever we want to do that we that we don't really have rights we're kind of dead to rights why because our bodies are not our own they belong to the Lord and for this reason it is so radical important that we learn to fear God and we recognize that we don't exist over scripture, that we are submitted to the words and to the ways of God. And that means there should be a certain amount of predictability. Like our children should be able to predict that mom and dad are going to be married and they're going to stay married and they're going to get really old and, and that's going to be their storyline. Our children should be able to, pr- to predict that, our, that we're not going to get evicted. We're not going to get kicked out of our homes. That we're, you know, there should be certain predictions that, that, uh, that mom and dad are going to make wise choices regarding what they're eating and, 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 and evolving the kinds of lifestyle choices. Like there should be certain things that are predictable. Like once we are allowed to gather again, that we go to church on Sundays because that's what we do. Well, that's the that's the that's a decision that we've made as a family that that on Sundays there's a lot of other things that we could do, but as a family we've we've decided that we're going to be predictable in this area. We should become r- very predictable that on Monday Dad goes to work because that's what Dad does on Monday. He goes to work once we're allowed to go, you know, back to work. That uh, there should be predictable that I can I can I can be honest with what I'm going through, knowing that you're not going to go crazy on me. Why? Because because your peace, it's predictable. That that I can tell you when I'm when something amazing happened in my life, and I know that you're going to rejoice with me and not be jealous of me. Why? Because your joy, it's kingdom, and it's predictable. I think in a lot of ways, we believers, us Christians should become far more predictable. And that predictability, that healthy predictability, what I'm talking about is consistency. And that consistency can only come from this moral virtue of trust. So the question is, is are we trusting God with the very core of who we are? Are we trusting the Lord with the decisions that we're making? Or are we leaning on our own understanding? Are we the functional captains of our own ships? Or have we truly surrendered our ship over to the Lordship of Christ? And if you haven't done that, if you've never said, 
okay, Jesus, I don't want you to just save me. I don't want you to just be my savior. I'm not looking just to escape hell. I want for you to be the Lord of my life. I want to know you so I can trust you. And if you're watching this today and, um, and you're, uh, you're already a Christian, hey, hallelujah. Um, uh, but I'm not asking about um, uh, what bumper sticker you have on your car. I'm asking you about how's the state and stature, how's the positioning of your heart. And if you're watching this right now, you'd, you'd say, Pastor Darren, I've, I've been withholding parts of my heart from God. I've been withholding parts of my heart from people. I've been withholding parts of my heart from my own spouse. Why? Because I've been scared. Why? Because I've just been surviving. Why? Because at a certain point, I started fearing man more than I, more than I fear God. And if that's you and you're watching this today, this is, this is your day to, to break out of fear and to come into this incredible dynamic where you know not only who you are, but you know whose you are. And let me just say this. You don't have to, you don't have to fully believe it, but, but if you can open up the possibility of this to be true, listen, God is good and he's trustworthy. That that when Jesus taught us how to pray, he said, pray this way. Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. That God doesn't want you just to know him as master. He doesn't want you just to know him as savior. He wants you to know him as father. As a trustworthy father. And if you don't know him that way, I want you to invite him to come not as a master not just as a savior but for him to come as a father because understanding God as father this is a radical key that is needed to open up that doorway of trust let's pray father would you come right now? So many sons and daughters watching right now. Sons and daughters who believe in you but don't really know you. Sons and daughters with good theology but haven't really stepped into a place of practical, functional trust. We declare our desire. Abba, Father, we want to know you so we can trust you. We choose to not lean on our own understanding, but we declare our desire to trust you with all of our heart. where there's been a breakdown of trust, where there's been betrayal. Father, we ask for a grace to be able to forgive. Lord, where we have been robbed of that ability for there to be intimacy, Lord, we ask for the kind of courage that there could be the kind of communication that can rebuild bridges that have been destroyed. And God, we ask that for Seattle Revival Center, this would not be a season where, uh, where the divorce rate peaks, but this would be a season where the reconciliation rate peaks. Lord, we ask that this would be a season when people make things right, when people have those fierce conversations, when people lean into the tension and they begin rebuilding, rebuilding. Lord, I ask that this would be a season when, when those here at Seattle Revival Center get to know you in a fresh an intimate way. We declare this morning, in God, we will trust. Let's say that together. On the count of three, let's just declare, in God, we trust. One, two, three. In God, we trust.
there's a beautiful place of trust that the Father is inviting us. We're from this place of intimacy and communion, from this place where we know him and he knows us. There's a place of mutual trust where we not only trust in him, but he trusts in us. And in this place, we can partner together to transform the earth from a place that's healthy. Know this, God loves you. He wants for you to know him deeply. And this is a beautiful season to step into the deeper things. Love you guys.